I grew up in this community, and uh, just a little anecdote, when I was uh, a young man, many, many years ago, I just got back from Army basic training, and I needed a job, and so uh, a friend of my dad, his name was David Hartwick, said, well, send your son up to Red Cross Pharmacy, we'll put him to work. So I actually worked at Red Cross Pharmacy in my young, formidable days, and I learned a lot about business and how things were. In fact, Andy used to look over the counter at me when I was back there at the back. You remember that, don't you? Yep. <laughs> I looked a lot different, had more hair, less of this. <laughs> but uh, Red Cross Pharmacy, in fact, uh, another little story. Uh, in my young, formidable days, I went to college at UMKC for a couple of years. And before I transferred back to Missouri Valley College and got an education that I needed. Uh, during that time, my, uh, the guy who lived in the dorm room next to me, uh, who ended up joining the fraternity with me and lived in the fraternity house with me, and ended up being the best man at my wedding was Matt Hartwig. So uh, it goes back, I, I have a lot of connection with him. So, uh, Bev asked me to talk about uh, ethics and the school board, and I decided I would just speak on ethics. <laughs> I appreciate having the, getting the opportunity to talk, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we consider leadership. Some of you may know this, I've been in the Missouri Army National Guard for 27 years. I, I'm a command sergeant major in the infantry battalion. And I've learned a lot about leadership over the last 27 years. I've seen great leaders and I've seen some poor leaders. When we think about great leaders in history, who do you think about? What comes to mind? I think about people like uh, John Kennedy. People think he's a great leader. Uh, Martin Luther King is a great leader. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, great leader, great person. Even Joan of Arc, I wasn't around when she was around, but she was a good person, a good leader. Uh, so what characteristics do these leaders have? Well, they have the ability to create and articulate a captivating vision for others to follow. Would you agree with that as a characteristic? They also have charisma and inspiration. You know, I've always been told that uh, uh, you can select somebody to be a leader, but your subordinates will actually choose the leader that they will follow. So um, these are people that everyone follows. So ability to create and articulate a captivating vision and charisma and inspiration. But there's one thing that's missing there because there's a lot of people that you can name that are leaders that had that charisma and inspiration and actually captivated people and, and led them into sometimes in the worst direction. For example, Adolf Hitler is an example of somebody who was a leader who had those two things but was missing the third thing that I'm going to talk about. Even uh, David Koresh, you guys remember him? Some of you may even remember a guy named Jim Jones. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, so, all of these had the ability to create and articulate a captivating vision with charisma and inspire people to follow them, but they lack ethics and moral values that we would deem necessary for great leaders. Uh, so you can have charisma and you can have a vision that you can sell to other people, but if you don't have that moral and ethical standing, you don't become a great leader. You can lead people, but you're not a great leader. Uh, which is kind of interesting because Professor Marianne Jennings who's the director of the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics at Arizona State University. Uh, she did a survey of her students, and she said, many students today find that studying business ethics is a waste of time, and they resent it. Students today think studying ethics is a waste of time, and they resent it. Uh, Two-thirds of the Generation X enter her class with shaky values and find ethical concepts to be foreign. In other words, if I'm teaching ethics, I don't know what you're talking about. Right? or the students don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, today's society has no moral foundation on which to base ethical behavior. It is all comparative ethics. In other words, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person. Or, everyone else is doing it, so I have to do it to keep up. Right? Shaky ethics? Some of you actually make a laugh. What's wrong with that? What's the problem with that? Uh, but the cost of unethical behavior is clearly visible. Some of you may have heard of an economist named Ronald Coase. Anybody know who Ronald Coase is? He wrote a, uh, many things, but in 1960, in the Journal of Law and Economics, which is a Harvard Review Journal, uh, he wrote the, an article called The Problem of Social Cost. Anybody know what I mean by the problem of social cost? The problem of social cost is this. 
it would clearly be desirable if the only actions performed were those in which what was gained is worth more than what was lost. Right? So how do we measure what was gained? Gains from unethical behavior can usually be classified as short-term income. In fact, Henry Ford <coughs> once said, a business that makes nothing but money is a poor kind of business. Henry Ford said that. A business that makes nothing but money is a poor kind of business. Losses from unethical behavior have a long-term effect and are often difficult to measure. In fact, one uh, economist said that doing the right thing doesn't automatically bring success. But compromising ethics always leads to failure. Um, that turns to think about this. The application of the Coase theorem is that unethical behavior increases the cost of bargaining or transaction cost. Transaction cost is the basis of the Coase theorem, which means that if it costs me more money to search out somebody to deal with, to monitor that transaction, to enforce that transaction, I'm probably not going to deal with those people very long. Uh, in fact, we're, as consumers, we're all creatures of habit, right? Once you find somebody you trust, you kind of deal with them always, no matter what <coughs> the good is in the train. You know, I get my coffee every morning from the same gas station I have for the last 20 years. I don't care. I don't even know what the price is. I just I go in and get it, and uh, because I've found people that I feel comfortable trading with, and that is the real benefit of an ethical business model. Therefore, as consumers seek greater value or greater benefit for the least cost, that's what we how we define great value: greater benefit for the least cost. Uh, the cost of bargaining or transaction costs become part of that decision, whether consciously or unconsciously. If you've been taken by somebody in the past, you most likely won't set yourself up to be taken by that individual again the second time. This is the cost of unethical behavior. Trust, a commodity that is earned through buyer-seller interaction, becomes a valuable commodity. In fact, Warren Buffett himself has said, honesty is a very expensive <coughs> gift. Do not expect it from cheap people. Uh, today we recognize an organization and a business that has given that gift of trust and honesty. I'll turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.